the indictment and acquittal of of turkey so uh tryptophan and serotonin metabolism if for those who know seinfeld Okay, so you get the idea. Uh, tryptophan has this bad reputation, or a good reputation if you're using it as a sleep aid, this bad reputation of being, uh, making you sluggish and sleepy and, and lethargic. And, and so you go to Thanksgiving, you have your huge turkey, uh, there's a bunch of tryptophan in turkey, and you fall asleep on the sofa you know, and everyone's running around, there's little kids playing, whatever, there's some like football game on or something, and you're just out cold on the sofa, and tryptophan is what gets blamed. So let's talk a little bit about the neurochemical cocktail that contributes to your alertness and performance, whether it's mental performance, physical performance, it's a bunch of neurotransmitters. Or if it is a contribution to fatigue. Now, this is a very crude diagram. It talks about some of the neurotransmitters. You should recognize adrenaline, noradrenaline, that's epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, you know, acetylcholine and glutamate. Um, endorphins, we talked about endorphins earlier, endogenous morphine, uh, large-ish, large-ish uh, polypeptide. So when we talk about polypeptide uh, hormones, right? So this is a this is a polypeptide and and made in the pituitary, made in some of your immune cells, and it binds to your opioid receptors. So you know what endorphins do. Oh, anandamide, we talked about that one. That's one that's not listed here. Substance P, you know what that is. You know a lot about that. That's another one that's not listed here. But this, the proportions and actions of, of these determine how alert you are, determine your mood, determine your performance and sort of mental state. So serotonin and dopamine become these very big players in human performance, whether that's aerobic or anaerobic or cognitive performance and, and the balance between those two. It's not just any one of them, right? You're going to need epinephrine in there too. Again, there's a whole, there's a whole balance. There's, there's the, a recipe for being in, you know, the zone or flow or whatever you want to call it that, that involves a lot of these things, you know, anandamide and stuff as well. But um, that, that balance, if you favor dopamine over uh, serotonin, if you have more dopamine in, in the synaptic cleft, uh, you're going to, to favor performance, right? Your stamina or, or your, your strength or or you, know, you can do the maze faster, uh, memorize things better. Um, so that's with, with dopamine. And there's a bunch of, there are tons of, of drugs that are going to increase dopamine. And so this is, this came from Lancet, which is one of the top journals in the world about a decade ago. And looking at the harm of, of particular drugs, what is the most harmful drug that we have? Not necessarily to, to um, oneself, to the user, but, you know, certainly to, to others. When you look at drunk driving and stuff, alcohol uh, rated by Lancet as, as the worst drug that we have. Heroin is number two, um, you know, crack cocaine, regular cocaine. So cocaine is a, um, this is a dopamine drug. Uh, it inhibits, do, um, cocaine is going to inhibit the, the uh, reuptake of dopamine and serotonin and, and norepinephrine, but it's going to inhibit the reuptake. And so that permits you to have more of that stuff lasting longer. Oh, uh, down here, MDMA, that's not all that harmful. Uh, it's right down there with steroids. It's one of the least harmful drugs we know of. Um, you know, where's, where's pot? Uh, cannabis up here. That's still pretty, that's low, right? So you start to get up here. Um, amphetamine with an F, amphetamine. Uh, this is releasing and uh, inhibiting the, the reuptake 
of dopamine, norepi-2, uh, increasing the total amount in, in that synapse. Uh, so that's what your amphetamine is doing. Um, MDMA is probably the safest version of all these presynaptic release of these. We're, we're releasing more of those things. And so if you're favoring dopamine, if you are siding with dopamine over serotonin, you're going to have that cocaine sensation, that amphetamine so, uh, sensation, that that kind of hyper-caffeinated uh, feeling. Um, now, if you're favoring serotonin, you're going to get more lethargic. You're going to be a little bit more tired. Uh, let's say it's a it's a marathon. That's one of the explanations of of fatigue as you get farther and farther into the race, more and more miles covered. Now, the the central governor theory, central fatigue. This is a 2006 article, and and it's really starting to be popularized. This is an old theory, but it's it's starting to be popularized really in the last couple of decades, uh, but looking at motor performance and, and so cognitive and, and physical functioning. Now, serotonin, 90% of this, 90% of your serotonin is in your guts. Okay, it's in, it's in your GI tract. It's, it, you're, you're getting poop on the march, right? This is, this is intestinal uh, movement is, is what, what a lot of it is doing, you know, regulating bowel movements. That's really your, the bulk of all of your serotonin some of it the 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 runner-up this is platelets and yeah you know, there's maybe seven percent eight percent somewhere around there uh that's living in your platelets and we talked about that earlier when we were in the second block and vascular leakiness was the theme that vascular leakiness we were talking about platelets and they can release serotonin and contribute to that one or two percent not much but one or two percent this lives in your central nervous system and this action that it's going to have it will impair exercise it will contribute to fatigue it will impair exercise and it comes from tryptophan so serotonin you synthesize it from tryptophan, um, hydroxylation, decarboxylation. So the hydroxyl group, that's an OH, that decarboxylation, that carboxyl group, that's a COOH. Uh, but there's just a couple of tiny modifications to tryptophan and suddenly you have your serotonin. And turkey has tryptophan in it. Uh, as Seinfeld, as that episode noted, that there's a bunch of, of tryptophan that's in Turkey. And you know, so the foods with the highest tryptophan content, potatoes, very low. Potatoes, very low tryptophan. Eggs, a little bit higher. Salmon, a little bit higher. Beef, a little bit higher. Turkey, even higher. And so we're seeing this kind of high looking level of, of tryptophan. It's just an amino acid, aromatic uh, amino acid. Well, I'll show you what that means in a second. So a sort of high level of, of tryptophan in Turkey, but like, look at pork, 2.5, it's higher. Parmesan cheese is more than double. Soybeans, even higher than that. Cod, higher. Spirulina, algae or algae if you're, if you're English. Um, and so tons of food have more tryptophan than Turkey. And yet at Thanksgiving, after the meal, people just slumber away, right? You, you get that kind of post-engorging meal, lethargic, you know, slumber sensation. And so what is it? If it's not tryptophan, if it's not the turkey, what is it that's making you sleepy? And I mean, yes, it is the tryptophan. It is serotonin uh, is a lot of the reason on Thanksgiving. Serotonin is a lot of the reason that we do get tired and sluggish and, and our posture sags and slouches into the, into the couches. Uh, but really what's making you tired is the mashed potatoes. Right, it's maybe the stuffing. It depends what the stuffing is. The yams, right? It's it's the cranberry sauce that's not in the shape of a can over here. Um, it's all of the sugar, right? If you like Jello and and whatever whatever you eat, uh, yeah. There's a lot. I'm looking at the comment box. I eat myself into a coma. This is sort of common. People do that. People commonly become comatose, uh, and 
a lot of what is culpable there is going to be the carbohydrates, not the protein, not the tryptophan, but those carbs are what make you sleepy. And the reason is we have to get tryptophan into the brain. Tryptophan out in the periphery, that's not making you sleepy. You have to get tryptophan into the brain to become tired, to create your serotonin. It has to get there. And how does it get there? Above a large neutral amino acid, not above a board, a large neutral amino acid transporter. It has to be transported across the blood brain barrier. And the branch chain amino acids, right? BCAAs, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and the aromatic amino acids. So these ones and these ones here are branch chains. Um, the AAA, right, you see these little rings. Um, this is just, and then the branch chains. Uh, so this is describing the shape of these. But we transport these groups of amino acids across the blood-brain barrier on that large neutral amino acid transporter, and then they compete with each other. There are only so many seats on the boats, on the boats that are going to allow you to cross. There, there's only so much uh, transportation to get you there. And it can be cluttered. You, you, can, you can occupy those seats, right? So the best way to increase, let's say this is the Titanic and it's going down, is capsized and there's, there are lifeboats but there's only so many seats on the lifeboats. There are only so many of these things. And who gets access? Who has a ticket to sit on the lifeboats? Well, okay, the pregnant lady, go ahead. All right, you're first. And who else? Okay, the you know lady with the really young kid. Fine. All right, you go. Uh, the Nobel laureate. Okay, you go too. You know, we 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 start making decisions of of who boards. Your brain, these large neutral amino acid transporters are not making real decisions. It's just matters of abundance. Um, if there are, you know, a thousand super poor people and 20 rich people, all the poor people get to board the boat. It's not like the rich people get to board. Uh, if it is, you know, one Nobel laureate, one pregnant lady, and 95 rugby players. You, those boats, it's just nothing but rugby players on those boats, right? They, the Nobel laureate and the pregnant lady get crowded out. So that's how these large neutral amino acid transporters, that's how they work. It's just matters of proportions. We talk about ATP versus AMP ratio and how much that affects our fatigue, right? How much that affects sliding filament theory, how much that affects activation of AMPK, but, the thing that's most effective, much more than increasing numbers of your own, is decreasing numbers of your opponent. If eight, if um, if let's say it's leucine and tryptophan, let's use these as representatives. If leucine and tryptophan both want to cross the blood-brain barrier or are trying to get across the blood-brain barrier, are candidates to get across then eliminating your opponent, leucine eliminating uh, tryptophan or tryptophan eliminating leucine, that's how you do it best. Increasing your own number a little bit. Oh, I increased my own count by 20%. That's not at nearly as effective. And so adjusting these ratios between uh, you know, tryptophan and branch chain amino acids, that's really what determines whether uh, we're creating a bunch of serotonin uh, out of tryptophan in the brain is what's the opponent, the branch chain amino acids, the competition, what levels do we have of that? So if you eat a little bit more tryptophan, right, put aside the turkey and have more cod, you know, okay, I don't know, get rid of this, whatever here's so like your you know, ice cream scoop of mashed potatoes and here's whatever your, your like peas with little carrot chunks and and let's get rid of some of this stuff and replace it with like soy and spirulina and cod and Parmesan. It's like, yeah, nah, it's not really going to do it. Um, increasing the amount of tryptophan, not all that helpful. Um, but during exercise, one way to reduce your opponent, reduce the branch chain amino acids to improve the odds that 
uh, that tryptophan is going to cross the blood brain barrier. Just go exercise because you clear branch chain amino acids at an accelerated rate. You don't just indiscriminately oxidize your amino acids. The branch chain amino acids are being oxidized in skeletal muscle much more than the others, much more than the other amino acids. So you go exercise and branch chains, that's what's getting oxidized. And again, much more than the other uh, essential amino acids and there's there's a sex based difference a little bit, but that branch chain amino acid oxidation can increase drastically, and it depends on exercise intensity. During exercise, also, um, lipids are oxidized at an accelerated rate, right? So you are going through lipolysis much faster. And this rate just continues to increase throughout exercise. The lipolytic activity of your, of your adipose tissue, um, you just start going through lipolysis and the rate increases and increases and increases throughout exercise. And the, the free fatty acids, as you, as you increase the content in the blood, they bind to albumin. The free fatty acids bind to albumin. What else binds to albumin, but much weaker than, than fat? Tryptophan. Tryptophan binds to albumin and not nearly as strong as fat, but if you go through a bunch of lipolysis and you mobilize fatty acids into the bloodstream, they boot the tryptophan off of the albumin. Now, only free tryptophan is going to cross the blood-brain barrier. Bound to albumin, it's not going to cross, right? It's, 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 it doesn't board the ferry that way. It's like if a, if a woman is holding a child, like, no, 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 no children can board the boat. That's, that, that's like being bound, bound to albumin. So if, tr if, there's if there's less fat in the blood, fewer fatty acids, less total lipid uh, content in the blood, then you're gonna have more tryptophan bound to albumin, less free tryptophan. As you exercise, not only are you eliminating branch chain amino acids, so the ratio of tryptophan to branch chains is higher, already increasing the odds that you're going to board that ferry, the large neutral amino acid transporter. But you start freeing up more tryptophan as you go through more and more lipolysis. And those fatty acids bind to the albumin and kick tryptophan off. Now, a lot of the data that have been looking at this stuff, super old, 1976, 1989, but once people sort of discover and, and something and, and it's just some basic biological function, you don't tend to see a 2020 study on something that was sort of settled in, you know, 1985. And so on some of these, these physiological phenomena, you do have to dial it back a little bit. You can see some newer uh, stuff here, but this is really the age of when, um, tryptophan uptake by the brain was this novel explored phenomenon and the displacement of albumin brand, uh, bound tryptophan uh, how free tryptophan is is going to actually contribute to serotonin uh, synthesis in the brain as you can see this is just from the from this article from the 1976 article from nature's and one of the top journals in the world but uh, talking about you know serotonin, that's what this is, is and the synthesis of serotonin, uh, that tryptophan in plasma can be displaced from its binding site on albumin by non-esterified fatty acids. And uh, non-albumin bound tryptophan. And so that is the, the method of how exercise may contribute to central fatigue uh, from the tryptophan perspective, from the serotonin uh, perspective. So during exercise, uh, you might, you probably have the same amount of tryptophan, right? You're not necessarily eating tryptophan as you go. You know, you don't have, you're running the marathon. They don't have gummy stations lining the walkways of, of tryptophan. Uh, so you probably have, you know, roughly the same amount here, but there's less total branch chain 
you know, amino acid, fewer uh, branch chain amino acids competing for those transporters, for the large neutral amino acid transporters. And so by ratio alone, tryptophan is more likely to board, but then also the longer you're doing aerobic exercise, you're an hour in, you're an hour and 20 minutes in, you're an hour and a half in, you're an hour and 45 minutes in, the longer you're doing this, uh, the more greasy your blood becomes, the, the more lipolytically active your adipocytes are. Uh, and you're mobilizing more fat into the blood and you're freeing up more and more tryptophan. So your ratio of free tryptophan, unbound, non-albumin bound tryptophan, to branch chain amino acids really changes during exercise. Now, early into exercise, not much of a difference. There's not much going on early into exercise, but later in exercise, especially you're going to get an adrenal response, right? An epinephrine response early on. Let's mobilize some energy substrates. Um, and so we're favoring that sort of dopamine, epinephrine, the, the uh, let's be a little bit more active mentality and physiology and performance early on. But later on, we're seeing uh, cessation of, Jacob, I, I see a hand raised, chime in, un unmute and chime in. I was going to ask, is this, um, so I guess when, um, I'm going to use Marshall Lynch as an example, you know, we all know like the whole Skittles thing where he eats Skittles and he gets a sugar rush and they did some weird sports center study that was just pretty much biased. It's like, oh, look, he gets stronger when he's eating Skittles. He's on a sugar rush. And I guess what I'm trying to ask is if we were to do that for an athlete, not like, is it really a sugar rush or is it just the fact that we are not, um, you're kind of blocking this cascade and we think it's a rush? Or are those two completely different? Really good things? question. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. I'm going to talk about carbohydrates in maybe you know a minute. And now there's other stuff that that could that could happen, dopaminergic stuff that, that could that could be responsive to the sugar. Even I mean there are studies where if you just do, I'll talk about this after Thanksgiving when we when we come back, and I'm talking about mechanisms of fatigue. But if you just do this sugar rinse in your mouth and spit it all out, yeah, sure, a little bit gets in there, a little bit gets absorbed. But you just you you rinse and spit it out. Uh, we have this. Remember when I was talking about about mTOR and I said the assumption of nutrition, the assumption of nutrition matters where uh, the cells like okay, you know what, we don't have the resources now but I have evidence that they're coming, you know, insulin. Uh, insulin is binding to its receptors and then that's activating PI3K signaling. And, and so we have the, the assumption of nutrition, uh, calories be coming. And uh, the response to that is we already turn on mTOR. We do the same thing with performance and, and sugar. We do like a mouth rinse. And so there's more to it than just the availability of nutrients. But I will talk about the nutrients here. <laughs> now, apparently, is the very next slide. So how does eating carbohydrates at Thanksgiving make us sleepy? So we talked about how exercise is fatiguing and it's the branch chain amino acids being cleared selectively. You don't indiscriminately clear uh, amino acids from the bloodstream. You indiscriminately oxidize them. You, 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 are, you are picky. You are choosy about which amino acids you're oxidizing during exercise. And, and that, that pickiness favors the tryptophan to branch chain ratio. But then also during exercise, remember, we are releasing fatty acids. Um, we are going through lipolysis and, and, and greasifying the, the blood. And that's going to, to kick albumin, uh, the, the tryptophan off of the albumin. But eating carbohydrates... Okay, now we're at Thanksgiving. How does carbohydrate indulgence make us sleepy? Because it's not eating the tryptophan, right? It's insulin. Eat your carbohydrates, you're going to get an insulin response. And insulin, just like exercise, is not indiscriminate in its uptake of amino acids. And so there's, there's a few of them that are particularly important for signaling insulin. And so leucine, glycine is, is not mentioned here, but glycine has also been shown to have a somewhat potent effect on, on the release of insulin, of activating uh, those beta cells to, to squirt out their insulin. But leucine, isoleucine, right? These are both branched chain amino acids, um, alanine, arginine, uh, 
uh, glycine as well. And the uptake, in addition to the trigger of these amino acids causing an insulin response. Now, insulin, it really responds to carbohydrates. You get a blood sugar spike and the pancreas really notices, but get a, get a protein spike and the pancreas notices too. It's just not as potent, right? It's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't just fire hose out of the, out of the pancreas. Now, Let's go back and do another old article measuring, you know, tryptophan compared to the other amino acids that are being cleared from the blood in response to insulin. Well, it's the branch chains, isoleucine, leucine, valine. We're seeing these ones be selectively cleared compared to tryptophan. So if you eat carbohydrates, right, you eat a bunch of carbohydrates, the potatoes and, and whatever else like weird puddings and, and there's the, maybe there's, what do you guys eat? Unmute yourself. What carbohydrate or protein rich, what are the foods you have at Thanksgiving? Be bold, speak up. Tamales. What, what, did I hear tamales? Pie. Pie. Yeah. Lots of sugar in that pie, unless it's just filled with, uh, you know, sucralose and, and stevia and stuff. Lots of sugar in there. I guess like, you know, ham, turkey, you know, regular stuff. Yeah, all, all of the normal proteins, uh, you know, the ham and the turkey, fine, we're getting a little bit of tryptophan there. But what are like the sweet potatoes that everyone confuses with yams? You guys have like those orange potatoes? Do you guys have those? Yeah. Yeah. Do you put like brown sugar on them and, and all that? Brown sugar, marshmallows. <laughs> those are marshmallows. And the brown sugar, that's really what's doing it. A sweet potato, that sounds so delicious. A sweet potato with marshmallows and brown sugar on it. Ah, yeah, that's that's A, delicious, and B, uh, welcome to slumberland. And so you're going to release all of this insulin. The insulin is going to selectively clear amino acids and alter that ratio of branch chains to, to tryptophan. Tryptophan doesn't really get cleared very effectively with insulin uh, compared to its competition on those large neutral amino acid transporters. So getting back to Jacob's question, if endurance exercise has a serotonin related fatigue component, you exercise, uh, you're an hour in, you're 45 minutes in, you're, you're an hour and a half in, wherever you're, and you're clearing the branch chains, you are uh, mobilizing fatty acids and, and, and getting tryptophan into the brain and having a serotonin-induced central fatigue. Endurance exercise has a serotonin-related fatigue component. It's basically the same mechanism that makes you sleepy after carbohydrate feeding. Right, so after you eat carbohydrates, you get insulin, and insulin alters that branch chain to uh, tryptophan ratio. Should you avoid eating carbohydrates during endurance exercise? It sounds intuitive, right? It sounds sort of intuitive that these marathon runners are like, man, you're just going to get that, that tryptophan sort of addled, you know, lethargic gait setting in sooner if you have those gel blasts um, at the, at the 10 mile mark. So you just, just go, you know, carb free. It doesn't work that way. Carbs are, they make you sleepy at rest. Carbs don't make you sleepy during exercise. It's really the only good time to have carbs. As you know, we get non-insulin dependent glucose uptake. We talked about that at exhausting length for over the last few lectures where AMPK is going to mobilize your glute four for you, glute four glucose transport. Uh, so GLUT4 translocation, get those carbs into the cell. AMPK will do that for you. And AMPK will also turn on the, the uh, hexokinase and, and PFK, phosphofructokinase, to start consuming those carbohydrates, make more ATP out of it. So you don't get an insulin response if you're exercising. If you're out there on the road, you know, jogging along and you have your gel blast or your power bar or your gummy bears or, or whatever the Jacob, whatever it was that Skittles, uh, you have your Skittles, you actually don't get an insulin response. And so you're already oxidizing branch chain amino acids during exercise. You know, you, let's say you're 45 minutes in and, and you're clearing your, your branch chains. And so insulin isn't going to do that. When you eat carbohydrates, you are not going to increase the rate of, of branch chain oxidation owing to insulin because you don't really get that response. But 
during exercise, you're mobilizing a bunch of free fatty acids. You're going through lipolysis. Exercise, very lipolytic. Uh, remember those fatty acids are binding to albumin and that is booting the tryptophan off. So you're freeing up tryptophan. But if you eat a bunch of Skittles, you don't get that insulin response, but you change the uh, lipolytic activity. You start to favor carbohydrates in the place of fat. You favor carbohydrates. And so your blood becomes a little bit less greasy. And so tryptophan becomes a little bit less free. It binds to the albumin a little bit more. How much more? I don't know. I haven't seen a compelling study that says, okay, here's 10 Skittles, here's 1,000 Skittles, and, and here's what the uh, lipids look like. Now at rest, there's a lot of studies that look at this stuff at rest, but you're, you're looking at a lot of insulin kinetics there. So I can't, I can't tell you the magnitude of this effect, but eating carbohydrates during exercise is likely enhancing likely enhancing your or warding off your fatigue, enhancing endurance, owing to the lack of tryptophan crossing the blood-brain barrier. It is not exacerbating and it is likely promoting performance. So carbohydrates, while inactive, you get that, that quote, food coma, right? You're, you're lying on the sofa afterward because of insulin and because of that ratio of branch chains to tryptophan. While you're exercising, carbohydrates are going to promote the continuation of exercise, uh, especially for people who are not keto adapted. If you're keto adapted, you're less you're a little bit more immune, less sensitive to fluctuations in, in carbohydrate storage. But the bulk of people are not keto adapted. The bulk of people are, and that just gets a little bit more complicated here if we start talking about you know ketone metabolism. But for, for the average person, while inactive, we are looking at carbohydrates sending you into slumber, not the tryptophan itself. Yes, Technically, the tryptophan is doing it, but it's not really culpable. The carbohydrates are culpable. They're, they're the ones who are, are like the drug runner running it across the border, right? The drugs didn't get across the border themselves. They needed a mule and carbohydrates function as that mule. Um, and then while exercising, you get the opposite effect. So that brings us to like, well, should I just eat a ton of branch chain amino acids during exercise to ward off serotonin fatigue. Not really, right? It's, it's not all that helpful. You're going to end up with this excess of deamination, um, potentially an abundance of ammonia. And I'm going to talk about the ammonia after Thanksgiving as one cause of fatigue, of, of central fatigue. So you're sort of trading one uh, mode of central fatigue, uh, central nervous system, brain fatigue, as opposed to cellular or peripheral fatigue. You're sure just trading one central mode for another. And I haven't seen a good comparative study that says, which one is worse? Or but but to, to stimulate mTOR, sure, have as much you know, uh, branch, have, have, you know, five grams of branch chains before your workout, fine, yeah, go for it, for mTOR activation, but to ward off fatigue, it doesn't really seem uh, to work very effectively, just go have some, have some carbs, and it's going to be, it's going to be better, so that is our Thanksgiving preamble before the meal, when, when people start falling asleep, after Thanksgiving dinner, you can explain it. You can say, ah, you ate too many carbohydrates. It wasn't the turkey, it was the vehicle for the turkey. It was that little taxi that took the turkey into the brain. And what did that? The marshmallows and brown sugar on the sweet potatoes. That's really what did it. Okay, we are doing a quiz. This is the third quiz, uh, each one of them, we have one quiz in every single block, and the idea is that we get people ready for the exam. And so the types of questions that will be appearing on the exam are these, right? The quiz questions. So take a screenshot, write them down. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, so say you're going to do like a, a high endurance exercise. Is there a certain like optimal time frame that you should be ingesting carbs so that way it'll start to like be in the bloodstream to be 
used i guess yeah you i mean you can really get carbs into the bloodstream fast uh hepatic glucose production um just start thinking about exercise and like yeah you can get your blood for people who are conditioned um i mean watch, watch somebody who who runs every single day at, at 8 a.m okay 752 happens and the blood sugar starts going up this pavlovian ring the bell and you start salivating stuff of you're at the starting blocks you haven't even started exercising and and, and you're your you're you're going through glycogenolysis uh and so that pka signaling in the liver hepatic liver stuff right you're you're going through hepatic glucose production your glycogenolysis and we'll start releasing some some sugars into the bloodstream as a uh, to get us ready but during exercise glycogen that's ah, really what you're you're going to be using you know blood sugar isn't really you only have between four and five grams of the stuff you know there's you you have in a mountain dew you have like 50 grams of sugar okay that's like 10 times what you have in your entire bloodstream if a vampire were to come like drain you in the night you have five liters of blood or whatever and, and you have like a gram of sugar in each blood in each liter of blood and so vampires they don't have a sweet tooth uh, I mean, if maybe you're higher than that, if if you have you know severe diabetes and and you're fasting, you know glucose is 600 or something. Okay, okay, we, we we're we're getting a little bit sweet here. But you right, and you, you wake up in the morning, and how much sugar do you have? I don't know, four and a half grams or something. I, and I mean, it just depends how much total blood, how much total blood you have. But or if you've just consumed a Mountain Dew. <clears throat> And so, but we don't, if your blood sugar gets low, you know, hypoglycemia looks like if you don't know what it feels like, uh, you know, it's not just like, oh, I'm hangry. I mean, watch the person crossing the finish line at the marathon when, when they're hypoglycemic and they're just wobbling and confused and, and, and sort of staggering toward the death line. Uh, you know, you squirt some carbs in their mouth and they wake back up. Uh, it doesn't take all that long for them to like, oh, where, where was I? So we respond pretty quickly to this stuff, but but it's when we deplete our glycogen stores that we things start to get bad. You're going to preserve your glucose pretty effectively, unless you're injecting insulin or something weird is happening. You're going to uh, preserve your blood glucose pretty effectively because your nerves need it. Your neurons, your brain won't touch fat. Now it'll touch byproducts of fat your, your brain loves ketones and and you're going to make ketones from from fat you know you chop them up in a bunch of acetyl coas we talked about this you know what is a ketogenic diet well you just you know link up your your acetyl coas is is the the creation of your of your ketones and so that's downstream from from a bunch of beta oxidation downstream from a ton of fat metabolism and so yeah maybe the brain is is will consume fat if you if you consider ketones fat or whatever but your nervous system is really reliant on on sugar but exercising skeletal muscle just use a bunch of glycogen we don't need to deplete our blood sugar uh, you'll just die and so we we actually suppress hexokinase during exercise and hexokinase is the thing that readies glucose that readies plain old blood sugar plain old glucose for consumption in glycolysis and you can say like hexokinase the first enzyme in glycolysis sort of but you skip it you don't use that if you're if you're going through through glycolysis um you know glycogen phosphorylase and then phosphoglucomutase and you have your g6p and you run your g6p through glucose 6-phosphate you run that through glycolysis so hexokinase just converts glucose into g6p and you build up a bunch of G6P through glycogenolysis and you inhibit your hexokinase. So you actually suppress consumption of blood sugar during exercise. You suppress it. So it, it, some of this stuff gets a little bit more complicated when you, when you look at how sugar reliance changes a little bit. In a human being, you know, we're not yeast. We're not just yeast like brewing us some beer. We're a human being running a marathon, a human being doing a sprint, a human being doing some sort of weight room activity. And so our metabolism is very different from how it is learned in your average 
you know, physiology, not like exercise physiology, but just like a standard physiology or, or like a bio class. It's, it's sort of a yeast glycolysis. And that if, if we behaved in that way, humans wouldn't exist anymore. We'd all die. Um, as soon as you start exercising, you get so hypoglycemic and just death follows. Um, so the reaper is like, oh yeah, you're at the hundred meter dash line. I'm just going to wait for you at the end. Got my scythe ready to swing at your neck. Right? Uh, so metabolism gets a, gets a little bit not finicky it's very well controlled but a little bit unique there john i don't know if i answered your question at all how quickly does it work it works very fast we're super fast you can you can squirt carbs in somebody's mouth and and like a minute later they're like they're waking up from from hypoglycemia i mean it's 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 a very fast response but the your liver tends to regulate all this stuff until you get very low in your glycogen stores you probably have about a pound of glycogen on board, give or take person by person, you know, your grandma, maybe she only has 50 grams of ATP, you have 100 grams of ATP on board. And, and how much creatine phosphate do you have? 120 grams? I don't know, all this stuff varies person to person. And so when I say glycogen, you know, stored carbs, you got a pound on board, yeah, probably more if you're an athlete, right? You know, it just depends. Maybe you have 350 grams in the muscle, another 100 grams in the liver or something like that. So you, you have a lot of carbs just on board and if you want to really be ready for the marathon do your carbohydrate feeding uh, leading up to it and there's different ways to do that and I'm, I'm sure the state of the literature has been updated since I since I last looked at this but uh, classically people would do a couple of days of carb depletion and then they would overdo the you know the pastas and and potatoes and marshmallow oh they would overdo thanksgiving and uh and they would get this super super physiological dose uh yeah as abby said carb cycling you do this carb cycling and, and you can you can really increase your storage amount now uh sometimes people will get uh gastrointestinal discomfort they'll they will and maybe that's a hell you know if you're running a marathon and everyone behind you you're just like it's like oil slicks you know, it's like coming out of the james bond car it's like oil so you're just like shitting as you as you run because you can't hold it in because you have like weird gi distress all right yeah maybe but but most people can can tolerate it pretty well and and you, you get this extra load of of glycogen on board and that's that's more effective than i don't know it's more effective it's it's also very helpful to to uh ingest carbohydrates along the way but even when you're doing that we have different remember i talk about glute four there's other glutes you know, glute two glute five there's these like sodium dependent transport there's there's different ways that we get carbohydrates um from our mouths into our muscle and uh, you first you got to get it out of the gut right and into the blood and and there are different ways you look at you know fructose gets in differently uh, from from glucose and and so you can people used to say and again there's there's probably data on here that you can fine tune from what I'm saying I'm, I'm not like I mean you know I don't really even really eat carbs uh, I've been on a ketogenic diet for a couple of years so so you know carb loading that's not something I've, I've you know done or studied in a long time but the early literature says a gram a minute that's sort of maximum rate of gastric emptying is about every 60 seconds, you get a gram out of there. And so you can eat about 60 grams an hour. Are you eating 100 grams in a sitting while you run those Skittles? Do you go just cram in all those Skittles and it's, you know, 100 grams of Skittles in a minute? There, if you're doing a marathon, you're looking at potential uh, peripheral dehydration uh, as you send this hydration into your into your guts to to help with with this absorption, that digestion and absorption. But then people figured out they're like, well, we have different transporters. There's different ways of of getting the carbs, you know, into the bloodstream. And, and okay, so let's do 60 grams of whatever maltodextrin or glucose or something like that and then let's add another 30 grams of fructose and you can accelerate the the intake and all right now we're up to 90 grams in an hour uh so a gram and a half a minute so there is still a ceiling of absorption there's a maximum absorption rate um and so in a sense it's still better to just have them in the liver to begin with to have them in the muscle, have them in the liver to begin with, because you don't need to go through all the effort of absorbing them, you know, out of your stomach and, and out of your like intestines. But 
uh, maybe you could do glucose in a tea bag, right? And just put it in your mouth and hold it there and, and try to absorb it directly into the bloodstream. Okay, maybe. Like you leave a, a tea bag of sugar sitting on your teeth for a whole race. Like uh, you just, you're, you're getting like orthodontia and, you know, three hours later. So pros and cons. You know, most people are just going to eat the sugar and 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 hope the absorption rate is fast enough. But you'll, you'll, I think the culinary industry, um, industrial kitchens of the world, are are trying to come up with the best sports drinks, and and it's a combination of glucose and fructose, and and or maybe just have maltodextrin. That's the thing I said that people pretended was fiber are still pretending as fiber if you get like a high fiber version of oatmeal or you know jellies and whatever it's usually just maltodextrin wonderful sport supplement if you're doing endurance athletics but yeah sugar metabolism during exercise is interesting if it worked like yeast and had the way we learn it in biology uh humans would have never run a mile right we'd all been dead just been hypoglycemic and gone into shock and coma and stuff so so we um once we get glucose six phosphate and you know, all this this stored glycogen the thing that can bind to ampk the beta subunit i ampk you get a bunch of of glycogen on board and and you will start lysing it right glycogenolysis glycogen oh lysis lysing your glycogen and and then your G1P, use phosphoglucomutase to convert it to G6P. G6P backwardly inhibits hexokinase. So we, so we sort of limit our amount of blood sugar. Now, when, when carbohydrates, again, when they get low, when stored carbohydrates, that pound plus of, of glycogen on board, when that starts getting low, uh, blood sugar regulation gets a little bit problematic. And that's when people get wobbly and loopy and deafy. John, did that kind of answer? Yeah, that, that was definitely a lot to write there, but I think I got the main point there. Okay. So just a few review slides. The uh, origin of endocrinology, Arnold Berthold, know his name, or to at least write it down, you know, middle of the 19th century, 1849, who cares, middle of the 19th century, and the like chicken stuff. Uh, so just that's the Arnold Berthold thing neuroendocrinology, you know, it's the hypothalamic, whatever, whatever axis. Um, all of these, these different axes, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, that's the cortisol one. So the hypothalamus is going to release uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, and then the pituitary releases adrenocorticotropic hormone, and then the adrenal cortex releases cortisol cortex hormone. Um, there's the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. You get gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and the luteinizing hormone. And then if you're a guy, right, uh, testes, testosterone, testes around. Um, for lady folk, that luteinizing hormone and the, and the follicle stimulating hormone, we are regulating uh, the ovarian cycle producing estrogen. But so that would be the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Uh, you know, with the liver, you get um, growth hormone releasing hormone and then growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. And then the liver, we're getting our IGF, that insulin-like growth factor, which is how most of the tissue interaction from growth hormone is, is working. Polypeptide versus steroid uh, cholesterol over here. And so they have these cytosolic receptors they have to get inside of the cell and, and they can wiggle their way in, right? They don't need transporters, like a thyroid hormone needs transporters to get in because it is a polypeptide hormone. So your amine hormones and your peptides and, and your protein hormones, protein, you're just um, getting big, you know, growth hormone that the sort of classic most abundant version is 191 amino acids. And so protein, hormone, insulin, like, oh, peptide, whatever. We're just shorter. I mean, so, but who cares? Um, so what are these things made from? Amino acids. Like an amine hormone is just made from an amino acid. And, and you, then you get bigger and bigger and bigger. These protein hormones are these big ones. 
uh where are they made well pretty much for these like hey these things are made all over the place it's polypeptides these things are made everywhere um like mechano growth factor mgf i mean the muscles making this thing and myostatin um a little there's a very small protein a, a small muscle made signaling protein a cytokine and and but then you know IGF one the bulk of that's coming from the liver fat can make it I mean you, you're you're making this stuff all over the place now a lot of hormones are are going to be like all right this is exclusive to the pituitary right? or this is exclusive to the hypothalamus or something but once you're in the periphery it's a lot of these um, cells and tissues it's not just some specific gland but it's a lot of cells and tissues are making these things steroid hormones uh, adrenal cortex and I mean, okay, with a polypeptide, yeah, with, with mostly glands. Glands are these little anatomical structures that are squeezing out um, hormones, but but other cells and tissues make these things too. You know, your kidney and and your stomach, right? Your GI tract, your stomach and GI tract. You're you're, you're releasing ghrelin and fat, right? You're releasing adiponectin and 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 leptin and. And you know, muscle makes all sorts of stuff, and and so a bunch of tissues are are making these. But glands is that sort of your go-to answer? Glands. Um, but for the steroid hormones, uh, the uh, testes, the ovaries, and the adrenal cortex. That's where your steroid hormones are coming from. Fast soluble steroids, water soluble. These polypeptides. Where are their receptors? Polypeptides. These are cell surface, except for thyroid. Right, thyroid hormones have a transporter to get them inside and they have this kind of steroid hormone behavior despite being a string of amino acids right so so we have a we have um peptide hormones that have uh intracellular um binding sites but for the most part peptide um protein if you're, if you're an amino acid or multiple amino acids cell surface steroid hormones uh inside of the cell but as we as we looked at in the mTOR section there are cell surface receptors but it's very secondary stuff uh fast versus short acting fast acting polypeptide and you can feel this when you get startled right something scares you and your heart starts beating right away um or, or you get you know, injured or like you touch something hot and whatever, your heart's beating, something, a dog barks and your heart's beating really quickly. Yeah, when, when we start looking at uh, like epinephrine, this is very quick and like things like osteocalcin. So there, there's other there's other stuff that's, that's involved, but steroid hormones like cortisol stress response, not, not that immediate stress response, the steroid, that cortisol stress response, this is slow acting, but long lasting. Um, you don't have something you just go break it down on the cell surface. Um, right on the surface of the cell, uh, it's, it's vulnerable to um, some proteolytic cleavage uh, if you're just hanging out there in the wilds, right? Just like in your house, do you want to be safe? Go inside and lock the doors, right? That's safer than just hanging out in the yard, if there's going to be some sort of, you know, hoodlum on the prowl, right? It's, it's better to be in your house with the doors locked. And so that's steroid hormones uh, compared to polypeptide. You know, autocrine, paracrine, and endocrine. Endocrine, this big, uh, let's get into the blood. This is the, the you know, postal service. It sends it out into the blood and eventually finds a target cell. Paracrine, this, this sort of... Um, perimeter right we have we have right there um you know one cell releases it and then our and our neighbor our community is is uh being alerted right so if you live within proximity of the tower uh, at pacific burns tower is that what it is with the bell tower with the speaker system tower let's call it what it is um, then you can hear what sounds like ice skating rink music playing at you know six o'clock at night or something. Uh, that is paracrine. Now, if you live in Lodi, you don't get that signaling. You, you'd have to have endocrine signaling. You have to actually take your, you have to like email your MP3 or something. But if you live in the neighborhood of Burns Tower, you, from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., you, you get paracrine signaling. Now, autocrine signaling is oneself. That is, that is activating oneself. Uh, MGF gets released and, and triggers itself. And 
and like myostatin sort of has like everything. I mean, it, it can it can exert action in, in every way, but we, we sort of think like myostatin is released and, and inhibits itself. Um, binding proteins, uh, today we talked about um, albumin, right? Albumin and how it binds to, well, it, it, it binds, it even binds to a ton of things. Uh, uh, it, it binds sort of weakly to your steroid hormones. Um, sex hormone binding globulin, that's, that's the strong binding protein to your, to your sex hormones. But albumin is also going to bind to a, a lot of it, to a lot of your sex hormones will bind to albumin. So that's a, that's a binding protein. But today we talked about it with tryptophan and fatty acid. So, so albumin, sure. Uh, sex hormone binding globulin, sure. Folostatin, we've just been talking about myostatin, right? So folostatin, that's a binding protein for uh, myostatin. That would be an anabolic binding protein because it's inhibiting a, a, a catabolic myokine. Um, IGF binding proteins, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, 98% of your IGF is bound to binding proteins. So you have six of those things. The third one is really the prominent one. So binding proteins, that, that's, there's a bunch. Uh, we Stuff binds to binding proteins. And what effect does it have? You know, so, well, just sort of three effects, but, you know, let's name five of these things. So storage in the blood, right? You're going to store these things. Um, fight degradation, extend the half-life. Those are all the same thing, right? And so there's there's a bunch of, of actions right there, but it's really, it's just, let's just extend the half-life. And if you extend the half-life, we're fighting degradation. If you're fighting degradation, where we are increasing storage, sort of a serum storage of these things. So there's one of the three. Um, deactivation, right? If you bind, um, let's let's stick with albumin, right? What we were talking about earlier. If you, if you bind tryptophan to albumin, you're not crossing the blood-brain barrier, right? If you bind IGF, to IGF BP3, binding protein three, you're deactivating your IGF. It, it can't bind to its to its receptor. So you're deactivating, you're inactivating, um, modulating uh, the activity. Um, so that would be number two of these binding protein actions. And then increasing solubility, that would be number three of what are the binding proteins do. Uh, let's increase the solubility of these. Now, lipolysis, we talked a lot about insulin. Um, that would be an inhibitor. Insulin would be an inhibitor of lipolysis. And as we know, uh, we are activating, you go through PI3K, PKB, that cascade, and you will activate PDE, phosphodiesterase. What does phosphodiesterase do? And if we're talking lipolysis, technically it's PDE3B. Um, you see it right here. These are the glucocorticoid receptors. So this would be cortisol. But insulin is activating PDE, phosphodiesterase, via PI3K and PKB. We are activating phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase uh, converts cyclic AMP into AMP. Right, AMP does not bind to PKA activating it. So um, cortisol would be a promoter. Now cortisol is weird, right? Uh, you're going to increase like lipoprotein lipase and, and cortisol is long-term fat storage, not good, right? But in short-term mobilization of fat, short-term lipolysis, cortisol is going to be a promoter. Um, and so a glucocorticoid, that's what cortisol is. And, and it will decrease the expression of phosphodiesterase, cortisol will. So you're going to um, have an inhibitory effect on, on phosphodiesterase. You are going to, through an autocrine signal right here, you are going to increase cyclic AMP. So you're, you are promoting PKA through two different pathways. Um, this autocrine signaling and inhibition of, of phosphodiesterase. And you also, um, you're going to activate some um, uh, transcriptional factors and, and that are going to promote lipolysis. So, so cortisol promotes lipolysis in the short term. In the short term, we see this enhanced lipolysis with cortisol. TNF, 
tumor necrosis factor or TNF alpha uh, is going to increase cyclic AMP. So TNF is going to promote lipolysis. Uh, lots of transcriptional effects. TNF is, is much more complicated. Epinephrine and glucagon, those are both promoters. And that is, you know what that's doing. I mean, that's just getting a bunch of PKA signaling going. So, so we talked about whether you're in the liver, you're in, you're in fat, you're in muscle. It depends on where you are, what is what is more active. But um, you know, epinephrine binds to a beta adrenergic receptor, um, activates adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase converts uh, ATP into cyclic AMP. So, so promoters, glucagon, um, growth hormone is is also going to enhance that signaling. That beta adrenergic signaling seems to be enhanced in the presence of, of growth hormone. You know, growth hormone and and epinephrine and uh, glucagon and tumor necrosis factor and cortisol and atrial natriuretic peptide. That's another one. Uh, increases cyclic GMP guanine monophosphate you don't need to know it but but if there's if there's there, there may be one where i say like what doesn't some sort of question what doesn't promote lipolysis and i could list all of those things you don't need to know the exact pathway for each one that you know there is a pathway and you can always look it up sufficient right but but knowing I mean, no epinephrine and glucagon because we've gone through that a thousand times. No insulin because we've gone through that a thousand times. You don't need to know um, atrial natriuretic peptide. You don't need to know uh, tumor necrosis factors exact pathway. You don't need to know cortisol's exact pathway of, of how this is working, but what they do, what these things do, that's, that's sufficient. Uh, phosphodiesterase, you know all about that, right? This is a thing that methylxanthines are going to inhibit, whether it's theobromine and caffeine and theophylline. And caffeine is obviously the famous one, but but anyone who loves chocolate gets your fair dose of theobromine as well. It's a very good one, very effective one. Oh, second messenger molecules. Uh, so this is your, your opiate um, the opioid receptor, opiate receptors, and, and prostaglandin receptors having these opposing effects on adenylate cyclase, which is going to convert uh, ATP into cyclic AMP and, and activate uh, PKA. Um, we talked about this just a couple of minutes ago, five, 10 minutes ago, um, the different axes, hypothalamic, pituitary, whatever uh, axis. Now, you don't need to know the level of detail of the posterior versus the anterior of the uh, neuronal versus circula you know, portal circulatory, um, how they work, but the hypothalamic, pituitary, whatever axis. And PKA signaling for glycogenolysis. Uh, so we talked about that a fair amount. Uh, if we're going to mobilize carbohydrates, right? We're going to inhibit, we're going to turn off glycogen synthase. We're going to turn on through phosphorylase kinase and then glycogen phosphorylase um, and then phosphoglucomutase. We're, we're going to turn on uh, glycogenolysis, the snipping of little glucosey chunks at first G1P through glycogen phosphorylase, and then you move that phosphate through phosphoglucomutase to your G6P. But we're, we're going to mobilize carbohydrates through PKA signaling, right? Very catabolic. PKA, very catabolic. We're going to mobilize these things. Insulin signaling, you know that, you know this thing. Um, insulin receptor substrate, and then phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. And you don't need to recreate these names. I'm just going to say PI3K, PDK, and PKB. I'm not going to say AKT on the test probably, but um, but you, you don't need to know, you know, what these things uh, stand for. Uh, lysosomal protein degradation, ubiquitin proteasome system, very basic stuff here. Now the lysosome, make sure you know that proteins, amino acids, specifically leucine, lysine, arginine, methionine, these ones are, are the, the big ticket items, the big ticket amino acids that are going to mobilize mTOR to 
mTOR complex to the lysosome. Uh, arginine is actually going to sense intralysosomal amino acid content as well as cytosolic. Myostatin versus folostatin, we talked about that. These are those Belgian blue cows, right? It's myostatin knockout. Uh, human growth hormone, the HGH, <sighs> jack stat signaling, but most of its tissue uh, interaction, right, is going to be coming through through IGF and um, growth hormone releasing hormone versus somatostatin. Somatostatin is going to inhibit it. Growth hormone releasing hormone is going to activate the pituitary. So these are coming from the uh, hypothalamus and they are determining whether the pituitary is going to release, whether the anterior pituitary <clears throat> is going to release its growth hormone. And as you elevate growth hormone levels, it takes a while, but you'll see an increase in, in IGF. Later, good sleep, right? You want good sleep to release your, your growth hormone. So things that promote and inhibit and that diurnal rhythm, it's pulsatile. You get these big pulses of it. Women tend to be higher than, than males, although some of these uh, peaks, the, peak, the kind of pulsatile peaks, might be higher in, in men's, but but the the uh, on average, just just go test everybody in the class right now, and and lady folk, you're you're higher in, in growth hormone levels. Fasting is going to increase it. Ghrelin, growth hormone releasing ghrelin, G H R L N, growth hormone releasing ghrelin. So so fasting, go fast for a long time. You're gonna get ghrelin out of your stomach and, and GI tract, and that's gonna induce growth hormone release. A good night's sleep, you wanna inhibit growth hormone, get bad sleep, have sleep deprivation. You're going to inhibit your growth hormone very effectively. Obesity will also <clears throat> inhibit uh, growth hormone. Vigorous exercise is going to increase, that is going to be a promoter of growth hormone. Uh, IGF, negative feedback, you know, it's still a lot of these things get more complicated when there's so many steps. And when we're talking about oh, AMPK and and uh, PKA and and these kind of weird inhibitory roles and stuff, but but this one's pretty simple. Where if you go through growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone, uh, IGF. IGF is going to exert uh, an inhibitory effect, this um, negative feedback loop, because you must have already had a bunch of growth hormone if, if you have a bunch of IGF. Now, functions of growth hormone, it's just it's going to do a lot of hypertrophic things, growth-related things. Increased lipolysis, I mean, that's not hypertrophic there necessarily, but but free fatty acid use and, and, and promoting lipolytic activity, but enhancing immune function. But then it's, it's a bunch of, let's get mTOR to... Uh, do its deed, right? So let's let's reduce protein degradation and increase synthesis. And so on the test, if I say something like, "What does growth hormone not do?" and then there's some you know atrophy thing, oh, it's it is you know breaking down your X, whatever it is. Like obviously, it's not doing that. It's it's very anabolic. The growth hormone is. Oh, steroids. Just be able to name some some steroids and like you know, androstenedione this is immediately before testosterone dehydrotestosterone is immediately after dehydroepiandrosterone is even before this and and that you can interact with these things you know the vegan diet diet with a lot of oatmeal beta glucans specific type of of fiber in in oatmeal and it's going to bind to bile and to you know shit out your bile because beta glucans fiber, um, where that fiber goes, if it's, if it's holding uh, bile's hand, that's going to go right into the toilet too. Bile's going wherever the fiber's going, the fiber's going to the toilet, and so now you have to make more bile, and what do you make your bile out of? And there's a bunch of cholesterol is in there, and, and so, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of fiber, particularly this, this soluble, you know, this, this, these nice uh, kind of bile acid binding kind of types and you know eating low cholesterol low fat low cholesterol high fiber you're going to reduce your total amount of cholesterol and if you reduce your amount of cholesterol then you're looking at how much is too much oatmeal if i eat a shit ton 160 grams a day you're fine you'll be all right throw a little butter in your oatmeal and you'll find eat a piece of bacon with it you'll be all right i mean if if somebody is i mean you really have to be yeah, don't stop eating oatmeal. Um, like the Quaker Oats guy becomes 
this you know picture of illness to you or something of like oh quaker oats oh you mean hypogonadism uh, it's a, a little bit of oatmeal every day yeah you're fine i mean you're eating but a quarter pound of oatmeal it's not so much if you're eating four pounds of oatmeal a day and and you haven't you know, you don't eat you know, meat or animal products and, and like okay now it's, it's time to just go test your you know androgen levels effective androgens on the liver eat it or inject it first pass hepatic metabolism right so if you eat uh your your anabolic steroids yeah they're gonna go straight to the liver um anything that's coming out of your gut or the pancreas or your gut uh first stop liver and then it's permitted into you know it sort of goes through customs first before it's permitted into the country uh so that's what that first pass hepatic metabolism and and customs they don't like to see anabolic steroids um so they will totally mess up your lipids but if you just inject it uh if you inject it then you're not you're not looking at that same consequence or peliosis hepatis remember those blood filled cysts that can form on the liver it's not going to happen it's rare but it can happen it happened on house md androgens on the heart this this it's not happening what people think are really happening and even you know i, sh I showed you earlier in this lecture i showed you that lancet article that showed the most dangerous drugs down to shrooms <laughs> shrooms and like lsd and like nobody has ever been heard on that stuff uh even like driving you just sort of pull over and like oh there's a tree that's that's two miles up i'm gonna just pull over now for an hour uh these are like the safest people on the road because they're not driving anymore they're just like on the shoulder be like all right i'm just gonna i'm just gonna look at that tree for four hours but that was was the most dangerous drug according to this this particular study and and again lance is one of the top journals in the world you know, top five journals in the world and alcohols you know right up there alcohol was ahead of heroin now effects on one's own body heroin was a little bit ahead of alcohol but um kind of effects on civil society and neighbors and community and and then uh, like alcohol was number one but yeah look where steroids is steroids is so low I mean, weed is more harmful than, than steroids in this. And, and, and nobody thinks cannabis is harming the nation other than people who are 70 years old. Uh, so you get the idea. Steroids, nobody thinks these things are harmful except for the, the super biased people. Now, can they be harmful? Yeah, you just really overdo them. Re super overdo or eat a bunch of pills. You just, just really get addicted to steroid pills. Is that harmful? Totally, yeah. But like for people who know the side effects and know the risks and do them appropriately, like what are you talking about? All the harm and stuff. Tylenol is worse. Alcohol is way worse. Um, the arguments against steroids. Um, there's one lecture where I went through all of these things, and it was just this big explosion of uh, enzymatic inhibition. And it was like the only time I covered it. But you know what these things are. I'm not going to talk about mixed on the exam. That's the one that's a little bit weirder. But allosteric, you know, these enzymes have an allosteric site. And you're going to change the shape of the active site. You can positively modulate or negatively. So you can allosterically inhibit is usually what we're talking about with like drugs is usually not like, ooh, let's make that active site even more pretty. But, uh, you know, you, you bind something like with PFK we talked about where, yeah, you need, you need ATP to run this thing. But if you have an abundance of ATP, ATP binds to the allosteric site, which changes the shape, the conformation, the shape of the, of the active site. And so its enzymatic activity is, is no longer running. Uh, it's it's substrate is no longer binding. It's, it's enzymatic activity is no longer running. Uh, competitive inhibition, you're binding to the active site in the place of the inhibitor. Um, that's what a competitive inhibitor is doing. Non-competitive, uh, it just doesn't care if it's if it's like you can be bound, you're not bound, whatever. I'm just binding my own little seat over here. I, I have my, it's like the, the super rich person who has their chair at the restaurant. It's like that table's permanently reserved for them. They don't care if you're eating at the table next to it. They, uh, there could be someone seated there. The restaurant could be empty. They're just going to come in and sit down. But as soon as they sit down, the waiting staff only attends uh, to them. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Like somebody with like Donald Trump, I'm sure has some restaurant that he likes, which turns out to be McDonald's probably. Um, I, I think in the Michael Wolf book, that's what he says. He loves McDonald's because he thinks everyone's trying to poison him. And uh, uh, let's say uh, Donald Trump has some has some like fancy restaurant and everyone is there for prom night. 
Donald Trump doesn't care. He doesn't care about prom night, right? He just goes in and there's this little table that's reserved for him that has a framed picture of him on it. And nobody's allowed to sit there. And if somebody is sitting there, then they escort him out really in a hurry. All right, here's, here's your money back. Get out of here, hurry. And then Donald Trump goes and sits down. Donald Trump does not care if anybody else is sitting anywhere in the restaurant. Doesn't give a shit. So there could be people there, not people there. Other people could come, other people could leave. But as soon as Donald Trump sits down, the whole entire wait staff starts attending to him and nobody else gets any attention. That's how a, how a non-competitive inhibitor works. Doesn't care about anybody else. He's going to go do his thing. Uncompetitive inhibitor. This is, uh, if, I, if I say the words potentiated by the inhibition, potentiated by, uh, the substrate uh, enzyme complex has to be formed first. The enzyme has to link up with its with its substrate, and then that opens up the binding site for the inhibitor. So that's what uncompetitive means. It's, it can't bind. It, it can't do what um, non-competitive does, where it's just like, oh, nothing's bound. Ah, I might as well just sit down anyway. I'm, I'm here early. That's fine. It, it can't do that. Suicide inhibition, that's your aspirin, right? This is the this is the irreversible version of competitive inhibition. I mean, there's a lot of reversible action up here. Suicide, irreversible. This one's irreversible. It starts catalyzing the reaction and then, oh shit, you're not who I thought you were. Accumulation of product. This is what I was talking about earlier today with you, accum you go through a bunch of glycogen phosphorylase and phosphoglucomutase you get a bunch of G6P. Now that G6P backwardly inhibits hexokinase because hexokinase would be converting glucose, plain old glucose, plain old blood sugar, the vampire's sweetener. It would be converting that into G6P, but you got all this G6P from phosphoglucomutase. Well, we don't need hexokinase. Hexokinase, you, you take a you know, take a break. You take a breather for a while. You just sit back. We have enough G6P. Thank you. Um, so that's accumulation of product. Now, phosphorylation. If you don't know what phosphorylation is by now, whew, you're not going to do well in this test, right? Because that's all we've been talking about for the last you know, eight lectures is phosphorylation cascades. We have these kinases, phosphorylating stuff. We have MAP kinase, protein kinase B, um, protein kinase A. We have, you know, mitogen activated protein kinase. We have, we have all of these kinases. mTOR itself is a kinase. So if you don't know phosphorylation cascade, oh yeah, you got to start over from the beginning with mTOR. Ouch. So I think you know, I think you know, everyone knows this, knows that stuff. Um, epinephrine's mobilization of carbs, you know what protein turnover is and, and cell signaling cascades. And we'll end on, on this slide where uh, this, this interaction between PKB and PKA. And remember, there's evidence that PI3K is also activating PDE because there's there's been uh, limited data, but data that shows inhibition of, of PKB and you're still getting PDE phosphorylation. But, but PI3K, PKB signaling, we're going to activate PDE. And PDE, remember, converts cyclic AMP into AMP, but you need cyclic AMP to bind to PKA. And PKA is phosphorylating hormone-sensitive lipase and perilipin, the coat on the lipid droplet. And really what does the second step, the second step in, in lipolysis is hormone-sensitive lipase. And so generally regarded as the, as the rate limiting step in lipolysis is, is going to be hormone sensitive lipase, adipose triglyceride lipase really does the TAG, the triacylglycerol, the triglyceride, but hormone sensitive lipase is, is sort of regarded as the rate limiting step. And, and so lipolytic activity is inhibited by PKB signaling. You know, this is a beta adrenergic receptor. There's your adenylate cyclase converting ATP into cyclic AMP, and that's what's going to, for those little guys, you're going to bind to a PKA and, and initiate uh, lipolysis. Now, this, we're in a fat cell. We're in a fat cell right here. If we're, if we're, in, if we're in the liver, we're mobilizing carbohydrates, right? We're, we're doing glycogenolysis. It's really the same signaling cascade, but what PKA is phosphorylating is going to be different. You know, phosphorylase kinase, which phosphorylates glycogen, phosphorylase, which then starts doing our snipping. And then it would also be, PKA would also be inhibiting, phosphorylating and inhibiting uh, glycogen synthase. So a lot of these things, a lot of what you ask, and other people here now, uh, what you're asking, 
there aren't answers. There's a map though, and there's creativity that you can use. And if you look through the map and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I've roadblocked over here. I put up some cones, put up some cones on this, on this pathway, but that's not the only road, right? It's like, well, how do I get to mTOR? You can't get that from here. But that's, that's a wonderful REM song from the 80s, can't get that from here. But that's not really how the body works. And there's, there's detours that you can take if you figure out how to exploit it. Now, does that mean you take a bunch of aspirin and phosphatidic acid? Maybe. I, yeah, I wouldn't take aspirin and arachidonic acid. That sounds, that sounds terrible. But uh, unless you want to be wheezing or something. But... Are, are there solutions to, uh, you know, pain relief? Okay, we'll do this drug and this supplement and we have this limitation, so let's include this also. And then we, you come up with a balance, right? So you weigh it down over here, like, whoa, 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 whoa let's counterbalance. And, th and then you get traffic moving again. And I think the answer is absolutely yes, but I think the state of evidence is a shrug. And that's where, that's where you come in with, you know, theses and dissertations and, and put all of your thoughts to the paper. So whatever your condition, your environment, your scenario, your goal, whatever all of this stuff is, understanding how to use the information we've been talking about in an effective, in the most effective known way. Now, is there some like CRISPR thing in the future that you can do? Yeah, but who cares? I don't think we're as close as people think um, to doing this. Um, whether it's kind of ethical prohibitions or or it's it's risk of absurd adverse events, whatever it is. I, I, I don't think like gene manipulation and then suddenly we're all who we hoped we would be. At, like, just draw a picture, I'll make you that. Um, here's a needle, this will convert you into your drawing. Like, I don't think we're anywhere near that. And so what do we have for our engagement with, with diet and exercise and, and other interventions, whether it's physical therapy or, or pharmacology or whatever? We have a map and we get to draw, we get to plan our route. All right, how am I gonna get from point A to point B? All right, point B is like a lot of activity, uh, just kind of hanging out on the surface of the lysosome or or maybe point B, we're, we're at point A, which is a diagnosis of cancer, right? And point B is how the hell do I get mTOR away from the lysosome? I, I don't want that shit. I, I, this is just, I'm just gonna get like huge cancer. Like how do you get huge biceps? Same way you get huge cancer, right? It, it, a, a bunch of this kind of out of control growth, right? You wanna regulate in the direction that is optimal for you. And that is where if you know the information, if you know the vocabulary and sort of syntax and whatever, and, um, uh, you can speak the language, right? If you know mTOR, if, if you know the, the enzymes and the proteins that, that aren't enzymes, and, and if you know what these things are, you can use it. Right? You can speak that language and you can use it and you can come up with really creative things that people have never thought of. I, I guarantee the questions that you all have been asking, Patrick, you in particular, but a lot of that a lot of people have, have been asking are people don't haven't I've never seen those questions asked before and and whether they've been answered I, I don't think so, but they're answerable. They're answerable, we just don't have answers now, and you can go answer them, or you can use the best of your knowledge to suppose an answer, sort of make some suppositions on your, on your way. How effective can you come up with a workout if you know mTOR? I mean, hey, you're gonna be like the best ever at, at coming up with exercise prescriptions. Uh, how many strength coaches in the US can compete with you? Like five? I mean, like not, not many, right? When we're, when we're looking at maybe more than that, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't, like at, at, um, at Ohio State, they have like William Kramer doing like the resistance training programs. He's like number one guy in the world uh, for this stuff. Um, and so at, at some places they have legit people, but, the, but your, your standard strength coaches, 
um, standard sport coaches? How many of them know anything close, even like in the same league as you? All of you now, I mean, it's remarkably few. And so you are, are positioned so much better than most professional employees in this field. So go take a class in exercise testing and prescription and you're gonna be a champ. You can justify your champhood with a map and color-coded arrows. <laughs>